This is the tale of a man who, at the age of six, had his entire world change in the blink of an eye. He went from a life he knew, loved, and felt safe in to a completely different world where nothing he knew still existed. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you like the video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and comment below. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. I've carried this with me for the past 24 years. I haven't really spoken about it since I was a child. You're free to believe me or not. In fact, I encourage you to doubt anything that you're told by anyone. I'm telling my story now because I've spent over two decades building a new life for myself, to the best of my ability, all the while carrying the immense heavy weight on my shoulder that the mental health professionals treat only as a way of repressing memories at best and as the delusions of a lunatic at worst. I won't blame you if you draw those same conclusions. I'm telling my story so I can hopefully drop the weight that I've carried around my whole life. This is more of a personal cleansing than anything, and if no one hears the message, at least I'll have it off my chest. Here it goes. I am not from here. And by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I mean where any of us live. It's now a few days after my 30th birthday. In about two weeks' time, it will have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in a poor suburb of San Diego and lived in a place called the Lemon Vine Apartments. They were a lower-class version of the Lemon Vine Apartments found in Lemon Grove, another San Diego suburb. My parents were divorced but friendly. My mother was very young when she had me, and very beautiful. She was in her early 20s and working as a model. She made regular trips to L.A. to do photo shoots. She modeled for magazines and had a darker skin tone being one-quarter East Indian. It gave her a very exotic look. When I was a child, my favorite picture of Mom was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she'd go to L.A. and I'd stay with my dad. Dad worked for the city of San Diego, and they shared custody. We even did Christmas together as a family, even though they divorced when I was still a baby. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember. I was six years old. But if there was any drama between them, they did a really good job of hiding it from me. On September 17, 1996, I was staying with my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. My dad had to work the night shift that week and mom was in L.A., so I was staying with my grandparents. The 17th was my third day there, and my grandpa told me to be careful outside because he had seen a rattlesnake earlier and he wasn't sure where it went. Since no one knew where the snake had gone to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old boy go looking around a farm alone for a rattlesnake was probably not in any Parenting 101 handbooks, but I'm sure they didn't think that I would actually find it. I spent all day outside trying to track down that rattlesnake, and much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, there it was, curled up and rattling away. For those who don't have one, it looks kind of like those green electrical boxes on the side of the road. I slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them that I found it. Now this may be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure the snake was at least 900 feet long, give or take. I found it, though, and I was so excited to tell my grandpa that I found the snake so he could go shoot it and make life on the farm that much safer. I ran in the back door of the house, which led into the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room. I expected to see my grandparents, uncle, and the neighbor couple that were visiting earlier, except they weren't there. And it wasn't the same living room. The furniture was completely wrong. 
the uncomfortable wooden furniture that my grandpa loved so much, was gone. In its place was a fluffy sofa covered in a floral material. The TV was in the wrong place, and it was a much newer model than the one my grandpa had, the old cabinet TV that sat on the floor. The wood paneling on the walls was gone, replaced by blue wallpaper. The floors, once hardwood, were now covered by a shaggy off-white carpet. The pictures of my dad, uncle, grandparents, and me were nowhere to be found on the walls. In their place were pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by the change in decor, I was even more confused by the fact that everyone was missing. My six-year-old brain accepted that they may have changed the entire house around while I spent the day looking for a snake, but I didn't believe for a second that they'd all just leave me there alone. I didn't see anybody leave. I was outside the whole day. I would have seen cars coming and going down the road and the driveway, and I hadn't. So I walked out the front door thinking maybe they went to feed the animals. The animals should have been visible from the front porch, but the chicken coop was gone, and the pig pen and pigs were nowhere to be found. At that point, I was beyond confused and getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone, but I couldn't find anybody. The neighbors that were visiting earlier lived across the dirt road, so I ran down the driveway and across the road, assuming that must be where they all went. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I started to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house that it was that morning. It wasn't even the right house anymore. Nevertheless, I banged on the door. When the door opened, and a woman in her late forties who I'd never seen before answered, I just started bawling uncontrollably. After that point, everything is largely a blur, because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where my grandparents lived. But when I went back to the farmhouse to find them, the people who were there were not my grandparents. I didn't know them. I begged them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Someone, I don't know who, called the police, and I was brought back to the town that I lived in after spending about ten hours at the local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home phone number memorized, but when they called the number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my home address, and I sat at the police station while they went to check it out. When they finally came back, they said that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments didn't exist. The address I gave them was to an apartment building called Merritt Manor, and the apartment number I gave them was unoccupied. I believe at that point, they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name and address of the apartment building. But I did live there. They asked me to give them the address again, and they actually drove me to the place this time. There it was. That was my apartment complex. But just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color, and the sign that used to say Lemon Vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to the exact apartment that I lived in, and just as they said, no one lived there. The police attempted to find neighbors or anyone who knew me, but everyone in the entire complex was the wrong person. They didn't know me, and I didn't know them. They tried to contact my father, which should have been easy because he worked for the city but they were told that nobody by that name had ever worked for the city in any capacity at all. Day turned to night, and I spent endless hours sitting there in the police station as they attempted to find any person in this world who knew me. I couldn't do anything but cry endlessly. A woman, who I think was either a detective or just someone who happened to work at the station, sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed animal, 
a Dalmatian puppy that she said was named Sparky. She said that even after my parents came to get me, I could take Sparky home with me, so he'd make sure that I never got lost again. She said he would take good care of me if I would take good care of him. During this time, they attempted to call my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. It was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived. But, you guessed it, no school by that name ever existed. The school was now called Anza Elementary. The police then asked me if I had ever been fingerprinted. And I had been. In kindergarten, they had us all go to the school gymnasium, and the police fingerprinted us in case we went missing. Unsurprisingly, this didn't help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my school, my neighbors, my apartment, and now they couldn't even find me. There was no record of my fingerprints on file, and I was too young to remember my social security number, but I seriously doubt that it mattered. They asked me my birthday and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing I told them turned up any information at all about me. At some point during that day, I was briefly sent to the ER because they suspected I may have sustained a head injury, but after being looked over by the doctor, they found nothing wrong with me, so I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying the night with someone that I'm not entirely clear who it was. Someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to focus on anything. I cried myself to sleep several times in the police station, and I cried myself to sleep that night as well, despite the woman I stayed with doing everything in her power to keep me calm. I clung to Sparky so hard, I'm surprised his head never popped off. I didn't have the picture of my mom to hold on to, so I held on to him. I didn't know what was going on, and no one could find out where I belonged. This didn't make any sense to me. I was only six, and just barely. I knew I lived where I lived, and my parents were my parents, and my school was my school. They couldn't all just disappear in one day. But they did. In between fits of crying, I begged to go home. I begged them to try to call my dad again. I just kept begging and begging. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times and places at all hours of the day and night. Police investigators, people from departments I still don't remember, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I kept getting shuttled between the house I was staying at and the police station. And then one day, someone told me they thought they found my parents and they were coming to collect me. Finally, I was going to go home. Soon this whole nightmare would be over. I could finally get away from all these strange people asking me the same questions over and over again. But when the couple showed up to the police station, my heart fell to my feet because they were not my parents. They had a son that went missing, and I fit the description pretty well. The woman started crying when she saw me, because I wasn't her missing son. But I was out of tears to cry at that point. Eventually, I was collected by child services and taken to a foster family where I stayed for a while. The police launched a campaign, asking people to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers and the TV news. I never let go of Sparky, though. Not for a single second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photograph because I didn't have him when I arrived. But I needed him. I would throw an immense tantrum if they ever tried to take him away from me. In the months I spent in the foster home, the parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was their child. I didn't realize that was happening at the time, but looking back now that I'm older, that's what it was. They didn't just pull me out there and say, Is this your kid? They were a bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to, quote, meet me, and upon realizing I wasn't their missing child, they'd often leave in tears. 
Thinking back on all these families that came to see me in desperation, thinking they were going to have their child back, I feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling that I really can't explain, like a type of guilt. I wish I had been their child so they could have him back and know he was safe. Most of these people probably never saw their child again. But I like to imagine that they were all reunited, even though I know that isn't likely. That guilt is one of the things that drove me to therapy as an adult, but like I said, no therapist has ever believed my story. The most common thing they tell me is I was likely abandoned as a child and was dumped on the side of the road in the middle of a farmland, and I repressed all the negative memories I had of the past. I didn't stay in any one foster home permanently, but eventually I needed to start going to school, and I needed an ID, so they issued me a birth certificate using the date that I told them was my birth year, but the day and month were listed as September 17th, the day I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month that I actually was born, but I imagine they didn't think I knew when that was. My name stayed the same, though. I started going to school sporadically at first. One of the child psychologists who saw me recommended that I not be placed in full curriculum immediately. He suspected I suffered from some sort of PTSD. I was put in special classes, and I was only made to go to school twice a week initially, and I changed foster homes a few more times, too. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was put up for adoption. I was never actually told that I was up for adoption, though, so I'm not sure of the timeline. People started coming to meet me, but these weren't people looking for a missing child. They were looking to adopt one but I did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that no one believed or could verify. I insisted that my parents would be back for me, and I rarely had a day when I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story does not have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18, because nobody wanted to adopt me. My life went downhill from there. My teens were filled with delinquency, and I did a brief stint in something that's similar to Juvie in San Diego called Chaparral. I never went to college, and I didn't start getting my life together until I was around 24. I still have Sparky. He's old and worn, but still in one piece. He's no longer white, but a dark shade of gray. He sits on my dresser and has always been there, as long as I've been here. I always get the same question. What things are different in the place I came from compared to where I am now? The answer? I'm not really sure. I've been asked about the countries, states, laws, planets, languages, you name it. The fact is, I don't really know. I was a six-year-old, and not all that bright either. I mean, I was hunting for a rattlesnake, for God's sake. I thought that California was a country back then, too. I can say that the president of the U.S. was not Bill Clinton. I can't exactly remember the name, but I learned it in kindergarten. I think the name was Robert something or other. I want to say Robert Wilmer, but don't quote me on that. My wife doesn't really speak about this, and I truly don't know if she believes me or not. My son does not know the truth. I told him my parents died in a car accident when I was a teenager, and I hope that's all he'll ever believe. I don't want him going to school being labeled the kid with the crazy dad. Well, that's my story. I doubt anyone will believe it, but it's off my chest now, and I can hopefully go to sleep tonight with a little bit of weight off my heart. No matter what you might think of his story, I've had a few exchanges with him, and I found him to be a very sincere person. Thank you so much for listening, and for being my family of darkness. No matter what universe or timeline we're in, you're always the constant in my life, and I hope I am for you too. 
Now, click on the end screen so you can hear more stories like this, so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends.